This one is so dramatic. Coming up, this 70s rock band ruled radio on their very first release. It was an irresistible ditty fronted by a, a sensational bass line and ear-catching mysterious lyrics about a beautiful lady. And it took them to the top of the charts, but then the band fell apart and they were, lost their record deal. They were desperate to overcome being labeled a one-hit wonder, so the band reformed, lost their record deal again, but they recorded a song on their own about the struggle of trying to get the record label to notice them and the cutthroat experience they battled through to get that first and only hit. And it worked. It gave them another hit. But would they be able to turn that momentum into long-term success or just fade away again? An original surviving band member tells us both the story of these two hits and then what happened next in our interview coming up. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. So many cool stories out there, we tell them here. If you remember the days when you spent forever walking around the video store trying to find that perfect movie to watch on a Saturday night, you know, before everything was at your fingertips with streaming, you're going to dig this channel. It'll be right at home. Make sure to subscribe below so you don't miss out. Click the bell, all that good stuff. Uh, so you know when our latest interviews are dropping. Also, check out our exclusive content on Patreon and our latest merch below. You can get that there. I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists go very deep on their greatest songs and albums. Actually, this episode could have been a bottle lightning episode. Today's is a good one. We talked to a surviving member of the 70s band Sugarloaf, whose Green Eyed Lady has become a 70s classic. Green Eyed Lady, lovely lady. Now, the band Sugarloaf started the 70s off with a bang as their debut single became an overnight smash, Green Eyed Lady. Uh, written by singer Jerry Corbetta and two others, this was an instant crowd pleaser with its ear catching bass line. <music> and the laid back, cool swagger of Corbetta's voice. The song was actually inspired by uh, Corbetta's girlfriend at the time, Green Eyed Lady. Uh, it hit number one on the RPM charts in Canada and hit number three on the Billboard Hot 100. It was number one in various parts of the country, just at different times. And actually, Sugarloaf was not the original name of this band. Uh, singer Jerry Corbetta and today's interview, guitarist Bob Weber, uh, they had played together in a band called the Moonrakers uh, for a few years, and then they formed the band Chocolate Hair. And this was the group that actually recorded Green Eyed Lady. That's what they were called. But then just before they released it, the record label actually talked him into changing their name to Sugarloaf, which was, I guess was the name of a mountain in Colorado. Like I said, after the record went to number one in different parts of the U.S., the band went through a lot of changes, and they released their second album called Spaceship Earth, and it sputtered. The two singles from the album, Tongue in Cheek and Mother Nature's Wine, missed the top 40 altogether. During this time, the band toured with the likes of Deep Purple and Eric Burden of War and The Who and many others. And then all of a sudden, the band, you know, everybody just left the group. And singer Jerry Corbetta was left with the band name. But basically, the band was broken up. And then to make matters worse, their label dropped them. And then Jerry Corbetta signed... Uh, with Neil Bogart's uh, Brute Records, I think it's called. The band actually came back together and they recorded a third album. That didn't do much either. And then that label folded. So they were in jeopardy once again of not having a label. So they went into a friend's studio in Denver and they recorded a new song. The song was a, a bit of a novelty. It was called Don't Call Us, We'll Call You, a song that eviscerated CBS Records who had just turned them down for a recording contract. It had some uh, real touch tone phone sounds of a number being dialed at the beginning and the end of the song. And those were numbers, real numbers. An actual phone number of CBS Records and another that belonged to the White House. A long distance. In fact, Jerry Corbetta would get a chastising call from somebody at the State Department. Anyway, this song ripped on the record industry, all that they had been through to get that one hit. And this song actually became a hit, and it saved him from being a one-hit wonder. 
It went to number nine. It actually spent more time on the charts than Green Eyed Lady, if you can believe that. So up next, surviving member guitarist Bob Weber tells us the story behind both of these songs. And then what happened after that is a very interesting story. I love these where are they now and, and what happened to this group. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, my favorite frames ever. Make sure that you take advantage of the phenomenal deals that Zenny always runs uh, to design your own pair of frames, the color, the shape, the size, and the style. You can do it at zenny.com. You can also download the new Zenny app. So here is Mr. Bob Weber with the story of Green Eyed Lady. Green Eyed Lady, Ocean Lady. That was a late addition to the album. Sure now that was. wasn't even supposed to be on the album. Yeah. Tell me about that whole progression. Yeah, we had, uh, we had done the tunes that you see on the album and record executives said that they really, they really didn't see a single. Well, okay, we probably didn't either. <laughs> and uh, we had been we had been jamming on this riff, you know. <laughs> kind of just working that into our show. And we played that. And the producer said, that's it. That's the hit record. Now we need to write some lyrics and a melody for it. So we had, uh, we'd recorded this. It was in, uh, it was in the December 70, 69, December uh -huh. 69. And uh, I was going to school here in Boulder. So went out, recorded it. I came back over the month of January, uh, Jerry and David Reardon and... John Phillips, who were in another band that the uh, producer uh, was involved with, he was doing records for them. Mm -hmm. And three of them got together and they came up with, with that vocal, with uh, the, the melody and with yeah. the words. That comes. And so I went back out, uh, I had some kind of some uh, additions I wanted to do on my lead, kind of cleaned it up a bit in a couple of places. And then they played the the vocal and merged it with the rest of the song. And, and first time I heard it, I said, that's a hit record. I got yeah. on the phone with my wife and I said, that record is going to be a hit record. Now, it hadn't come out yet. It was still, you know, it was in the studio on a 24 track tape, but right, you know, right, it, right. it was nowhere to be found. But, uh, it, and it came true. <laughs> It did. It you know, did, yeah. Not only was it number one in various parts of the U.S., it went to number three in the pop charts, but also number one in the Canada RPM yes. charts. Yes. Huge there as well. I just had somebody contact me from Canada, and they, they sent me a few of the few of the uh, the local hit parade charts from those days showing yeah. it was number one. And, yeah, I mean, that, that felt good. Green -eyed lady feels like I never see. We ended up go wanting to go back in the studio, so... Pretty much poured everything we had into the second album and uh the second album was great musically but it was kind of a different band because we had the the uh, new guitar player and singer and songwriter bob yazel and his songs were so so well crafted and great as, as songwriter songs we just kind of brought him in and said you know we want to make you a part of this so we went away from that uh, B3, mm -hmm. and kind of the, just the real clean riff to, you know, some very, very well orchestrated and multi-layered productions, uh, walls of harmony. Mm -hmm. Looking back in retrospect, I think we took our eye off of the number one thing, which was the sound that Green Eyed Lady had. Now, you know, I'm sure that Artist so relations so folks and producers and record company people would say, yeah, you got, you finally got it. Well, it's too late now, but. <laughs> Green -eyed lady, windswept lady. Your approach to the solo and just really 
putting that together from those guitar parts yep. that you've been showing me. Yep. So the solo, I'll take you back one step. There okay. was there was a band that I was in called Baker's Opera Company, which had a number of the people from Sugarloaf and some people that would, would end up with, that were in the Moonrakers. Uh, this is the time of Ravi Shankar. And I was mm -hmm. really, I was really uh, a fan of Ravi Shankar. So I got a sitar and I learned how to play it. And we'd be in front of uh, 5,000 people and I'd be on, a, on one of these big pillows playing the sitar and the drummer would be playing tabla. I mean, it, it was really, we, we didn't have the, the, the right to be doing that. We were just, you know, a <laughs> bunch of, bunch of uh, rock and roll players. And that's, that's spiritual mu music to oh, Ravi yeah. Shankar. So. Anyway, I was studying ragas. I was into the, the sitar. So when it came time for that Green Eyed Lady lead, I called on a raga scale to play it rather than, you know, your basic pentatonic or, uh, you know, I was using this, uh, a little different. And then I've always been a fan of West Montgomery. I was oh, wanted yeah. to be a jazz guitar player when I was growing up. And uh, rock and roll just got in the way, which was a good thing. But so I did. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it was a combination of a raga scale and the octaves pushed along by the intensity of the, of the tempo. The tempo, that's like a well, 160, that's a scatter it's, shot like, it's like 165 yeah. beats per minute. Everything that you hear nowadays is 90, 95, yeah. and that's pushing it. Everything's gotta be right in that, that groove. So, I mean, we're just, we're playing right on the edge of being able to manage it, uh, you know, uh, as far as our chops went. So uh, that being pushed along by the tempo, by the by the drums, by Corbetta on the organ, that's how it evolved into that. It still stands the test of time now, it which does. yeah, which is what I'm you know I'm happy about that. I'm proud about that. So all those things we didn't, we weren't copying, but those things influenced us. That's what we played. When we were jamming, that's what we listened to when we weren't playing. So that helped to form that, you know, what you heard on Green Eyed Lady. And, yeah. and that's what I'm talking about. If we would have stayed with that, with that, that thing that we had defined, maybe things, you know, maybe we would have been a, a big band right up until, you know, now. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. yeah. But we kind of lost sight and we took a different path. Green Eyed Lady, Ocean Lady. How did it come about with Green Eyed Lady? You know, Green Eyed Lady. Where did that really come from? Do you? You know, I wasn't there in the room when those guys wrote it. The songwriters that helped Jerry lived in L.A., and I know they spent time at the beach. And I've got to believe that was an influence. But uh, uh, I wasn't in the room. Uh, I was back here sitting in in CU Engineering School, <laughs> probably studying advanced mathematics or some other weird thing. And those guys are out writing, writing hit records. Child of nature, friend of man. Uh, we'd go out and we'd play gigs every, maybe every three weeks. We'd go fly out somewhere and play some gigs. But I was living in Denver and Corbetta was living in L.A. And he was trying to, trying to get his producer chops. And he was doing a lot of co-writing with people and, and just trying to widen his network of musicians and people that he was uh, co-writing with and performing with. But he, he, he still had the feeling that he wanted to, wanted to have the band. He wanted the band. So we got together and we, we did a lot of work here in Denver. And we went out to L.A., went to Studio Instrument Reynolds, did a lot of rehearsal. And that's how that 
that uh, album, the Brood album, I Got a Song Evolved. And there was a lot of influence from uh, outside songwriters. Mm -hmm. uh, we did some of that at a and Records, uh, I mean, A&M Studios, which that was a, a, I mean, talk about being in a, in a revered, holy place. You know, A&M Records at, at that time was, was just uh, about as uh, uh, trendy as you could get. You know, it started out with Herb Albert and, and Jerry Moss, but I mean, it, it evolved to being the place to record. So we got the chance to record there. And, um, you know, there are some good songs, very good songs on that yeah. album. But it just, uh, we didn't get any push. Uh, we tried to go out and support the album, but we just didn't get any push. So that kind of ended up being the next thing that happened, which was a repackaging with Don't Call Us, We'll Call yeah. You. And that was Don't Call Us was something we were just jamming. We were in a studio in Denver. <laughs> So that was the Love riff. It. Jerry sat down with John Carter. He was a, a, a guy who had come from Denver, played in uh, some bands in Denver. Yeah. and was a record executive for mm -hmm. Capitol mm -hmm. and a songwriter. So they got together and came up with a kind of a novelty song. It's kind of clever. It's certainly not Green Eyed Lady, but it, it caught the ear of, of the country. And it shot up into into the top ten. I think it made it to nine, and we sold it did, hundreds, yeah. hundreds of thousands of units. He said, "Uh, uh, don't call us, child. We'll call you." The riff is the thing that really grabs you at first. What you just played, this one, I mean, yeah. And then this one, yeah. Yeah. So that's a cop from "I Feel Fine" the Beatles, yeah. right? But yeah. that's. You know, like John, Paul, George, and Ringo. The artist is calling, calling A and R, and saying, uh, "You know, I'm, I'm Mr. Mr. Blues." And the A and R says, "Yeah, let me put you on hold." To say the least, the cat was cold. Don't call us; we'll call you. Mama, so uh, don't call us now; we'll call you. So that was any number of probably recreated anecdotes of our producer, Frank Slay, uh, perhaps Jerry himself, trying to go to people, trying to network with people. And they said, oh, yeah, hey, Jerry, uh, nice meeting you, man. Uh, let's, I'll give you a call. Uh, OK, D never, never happens. Never. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And uh, so the yeah. most used line in, in Hollywood entertainment history, right? Yeah, I'll give absolutely. you a call. Absolutely. You'll hear back from us. Absolutely. And uh, so that, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. Yeah, it's a, it's a widely used term. So that's how that ended up being brought into the chorus. <laughs> you know, We're still waiting. <laughs> still waiting for that call. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I tell you, the, the thing that happened out of out of that album and out of that single, we were we were known as a one hit wonder. When Don't Call Us hit top ten, now now you got two songs. Now you yeah. got two hit now songs. Now you're not a one hit uh, yeah. wonder. So I mean that strengthens the the stage show like you can't even imagine. Oh yeah, yeah. So we get we ended up uh, we did a tour of Sticks, we did a tour of the Guess Who, and I mean it was really uh, it was a powerful thing to be able to go out there and space those two songs. And, you know, really, really put a, a powerful and, and show. And quite on. a space between those two. But what was also cool about it is uh, sticking it to the man and getting away with it. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, huh. in a way. The man's still there, <laughs> you know. And thanks so much for watching. Leave a comment about Sugarloaf and the 70s classic Green Eyed Lady. What are your memories of this song? Do you remember their second hit as well? Let's have a great conversation below. What do you think? What other two hit or three hit wonder should we cover? I hate to call them a three hit wonder because they're not a wonder because they had a couple of hits, but it's just fun to talk about these bands, the highs and the lows. It's the most interesting part of what we do, I swear. Anyway, if you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community and uh, make sure to check us out on Patreon and to check out our new merch. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.